here you act, you're punished and you're free. But outside, out there, you act, you're punished by your own guilt complexes and you're never free. The punitive system does not work. My experience of Borstal convinces me that more criminal acts are imposed on prisoners than by criminals on society. You see my point. And also, uh, number three, being socio-behavioral analysis and rehabilitation. Our current methodology for dealing with criminals are as follows. Well, well actually, first, of all, first off, what is a criminal? Is a criminal someone who steals food so they can feed their starving family? Obviously not. How about someone who has been conditioned into a homicidal value system and one day kills someone? It could be argued that they expressed a choice to kill that person, but is it really that clean cut? Is it really a matter of choice? How big a role does the perception of the world through, through the conditioning you have been raised in and or subjected to play? Do you really... Do we really have a choice, given certain levels of conditioning? We in the Western world consider the act of uh, having, a, having sex with a child a, as a criminal act, but, however, in differing cultures, in, it's perfectly acceptable behaviour. So you see that the concept of crime is highly subjective, isn't it? To look at this a different way, say a person during their life develops a se severe degree of mental illness and this warps the inherent moral code so badly that it is unrecognizable to them or anyone else. The inner workings of an insane mind are so individualized and complex to explain, so I'll just say that one day this person decides to kill someone. Simple enough. During that trial, it is decided that they are not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility, and instead of a prison sentence, they are sent to a psychiatric hospital to quote-unquote fix them. Now really, what is so different about that scenario from any other murder case? That the perpetrator of the violent act is clearly insane from the perspective of the majority? Hey, as far as the perpetrator may be concerned, all the rest of you are the crazy ones. My point is, why do we feel we have the arrogance to distinguish the insane action of one man and the blatantly murderous actions of, say, Bayer, or BP, or the Bush administration? Three Bs. Hmm. Um... Or any other person who, who has been conditioned to think that murder is a viable option or s to certain problems. There's no difference, really, is there? Well, I, su I suppose the only difference is the obvious symptoms of the cognitive dissonance sus suffered by the sane and the insane and, and the severity of it. But that is really the only difference, isn't it? But what troubles me a hell of a lot more is that we condone murder on the grand scale if done by governments and armies, but we abhor murder on the small scale if done by individuals. What's the difference, though? It's still murder, whichever way you cut it. I mean, this, I mean, this reminds me of, of a picture someone on uh, Facebook posted up a while ago, um, and it had... It, it was a, it was basically a picture of a, um, a dozen bodies uh, piled up on the side of a dozen or so bodies piled up on the side of the road, and there was a caption underneath that said, "Kill one person and we call it murder. Kill one thousand and we call it foreign policy." And that is what gets me. As long as we're doing it for our queen and country or for freedom, then both are com um, both of which you know by the way are complete BS. And you know. But for that reason, we say that murder is okay, and even worse, it, we say that it's necessary and heroic. I mean, come on, what the hell are we thinking? Yeah, <clears throat> but I'm I'm sorry, I'm going off on a on a tangent here. Um, okay. Uh, at present, perpetrators of crime are apprehended and thrown in a cell for a period of time, which is generally quite loosely relative to the gravity of the crime they committed. Um, at the time, at the um, at the time being subjected to a horrific, abusive, limiting, uh, regimental, and stratified social environment, among other perpetrators of crime, and expect that after this stint in the company of like-minded people, the convict is somehow reminded of this criminal behaviour. How can we not collectively 
seeing the fallacy of this process and its overall inability to work is ridiculous. Yeah, this is how we solve these um, these problems. <coughs> this is how we solve these problems in our current society. How can we expect to throw a person in a barrel of feces and not have them stinking to high heaven when you let um, let them out in five, ten, or fifteen years' time? Think about it this way: if you wanted to learn to be a true, aberrant, emotionless, violent, calculating, and successful criminal, where is the best place to go in order for you to learn? Prison of course. So you see the justice system is actually not a justice system at all but I would actually call it an injustice system or as uh, Dr. Garbamato said the justice system is completely criminal. We are turning people into criminals not deterring people away from being a criminal and thanks to the glorious phenomenon known as institutionalization after a certain period depending on the individual's threshold of acceptance and indoctrination Prison becomes the viable option. It becomes a safe haven for all you have come to know and be familiar with over time. So, as a result, following release, you will notice a growing number of re-offence within about five years, if you look at the statistics. I mean, as Morgan Freeman said in the film Shawshank Redemption, um, I'm telling you, these walls are funny. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes... It gets so you depend on them. That's institutionalized. Now, how about we move away from all that crap? How about we develop a system of dealing with aberrant and destructive behavior that actually works? Wouldn't that be uh, a good way to go? Anyway, question seven. How exactly is this to be implemented into our current system? Okay, the answer to that is simple. It can't. An RBE, by definition, cannot realistically exist within a monetary-based economy. Because in our current model, um, you know, the uh, the allowance isn't there. Our current our current system doesn't allow for that level of freedom to anyone. And the guiding principles of both systems, both an RBE and a capitalist system, are actually diametric diametrically opposed. And that isn't to say that there can't be certain negotiations to be made where a monetary system can coexist with an RBE. But that would only have to happen if someone still feels ardently romantic about money. And, by the way, they're more than free to go off and build their own monetary system. They are free to do that. No one's going to stop them. Just don't try and harm any of us who do wish to live sustainably. That's what we ask for. The trouble there, however, is that... Um, is that... Uh, is how that monetary system may begin to ignore that agreement and emerge as aggressive and domineering and you know that is the inevitable nature of a monetary based system just take our current model for example okay question eight is an RBE for the world or just one country uh, well of course it is it is you know uh, an RBE by its very nature is a global system it cannot work in an enclosed and limited manner because it utilizes the most sustainable and optimal methods with the most sustainable and optimal means. Meaning the uh, the resources of the planet, wherever they may be, and they are scattered all over the planet, are declared as common heritage of all. I mean, you cannot have a country-specific RBE, because that, um, that would mean that only the resources contained in that country's territory can be used. Um, but... What if that country has either none or nowhere near the resources needed to create the needed infrastructure uh, and, the, and therefore the most optimal way of life? You know, of course, you know, for these reasons, an RBE must be a global system. It has to be. There's no other way. Okay, question nine. What, uh, what could you see working better than money? The same incentive system that voluntary workers have? Yeah, the millions of people across... Uh, millions upon millions of people, po possibly hundreds of millions of people across the planet who work for voluntary causes. They don't work for money, do they? That's the closest equivalent to money uh, in an RBE because money isn't replaced by anything. You know, the idea of currency is a monetary invention. And an RBE is completely different. The notion of um, of having to exchange something for your means of survival is an outdated, obsolete and restrictive means of social operation because 
Um, advanced automation provides an abundance of the necessities of life with the consideration built upon access rather than acquisition. Money never really solved any problems. It was a naive way to deal with real scarcity many years ago, and it, and it worked as, to a certain extent for a period. But it, it, I mean, it did have a purpose in those times, but, uh, but that's simply not the case anymore. You know, when the concept of a growth economy had enough room to do its thing, then yeah, the idea of growth wasn't a foreseeable problem. However, now it's doing much, much more harm than help. You know, not to mention the generation of such harmful and aberrant values and methods such as greed and self-interest. I mean, as a result, we're beginning to see how unsustainable the act of growth within a finite environment really is. I mean, the mantra of um, of the um, of money these days is perfectly summed up uh, by the words of Gordon Gecko from the film Wall Street when he said uh, greed for a lack of better word is good anyway question 10 will still will people still have the right to their own opinion okay guys I know there was a couple of people that uh, that um, that were trying to debate with me on Facebook about this here's uh, here's my take on it and please Open up your ears, open up your minds, bear with me, okay? Here it is. Overall, the answer to that is no. Now, bear with me. I can already sense that some people's hairs are going up about this. Just bear with me. Oh, no. Oh, no, he's going to be a tyrant. No. All right, just bear with me. One thing I should stress, opinions are one thing. Even having them and expressing them, fine. But entitling people to them is dangerous. It's the same reason why healthcare workers are forbidden from stating opinions on care plans. Okay, I used to be a healthcare worker. I used to write in those care plans. Do you know, um, you know, I know why you can't state opinion. You know why? Because it's a distortion of the truth. It's a misrepresentation of the facts. Because opinion is subjective. It's fluid. It's, it's only dependent on a person's life experience, bias, beliefs, and perception. If you give people the right to their opinion, you're giving them a right to be wrong and reject facts. Now, I wouldn't feel safe in a world where everyone had a right to an opinion, because the system would fall apart if it was governed by people's rightful orientation of going with subjective opinion. You know, I don't want a, uh, I don't want a plumber, you know, being, um, being entitled to their opinion of how a country should be run, you know? It's the entitlement of opinion that has given even the religious their stranglehold over the world. Think about it. Now, as I said, it is fine for people to have an opinion. But if we entitle people to it, then it eradicates the formality of opinions changing. For example, um, I could see you walking past a playground with a bag of sweets in your hand. I could generate an opinion that you're a paedophile. However, if I accept the opi um, my opinion as merely transitory and not based upon facts, I could accept the fact of the situation that you are merely walking past a playground with a bag of sweets in your hand. Opinion is fine, but the lesson that we need to accept is that opinion is nothing more than preconceptions ahead of facts, and therefore they're completely undeserving of the grounding of entitlement. But anyway, I've run out of time now. Um, I thank you all for listening. Uh, next uh, next time, uh, I, sh I should be on the fifth of July. Um, I should fifth uh, sh of June. Yes, fifth of June. I should have uh, Douglas Millet on uh, to interview him. We're going to be talking about technical things and technological things and Zeit News, a uh, website that he's working on. But anyway, um, I thank you all for listening, and you all take care. Bye bye now. <laughs>